Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Liebscher. Uh, I'm a double domer who had the incredible opportunity to both play and coach with Muffet back in the day. And I now currently serve as Associate Vice President of Development and the Executive Director of Individual and Family Giving at Notre Dame. Over the past year, by necessity, more and more of our daily lives have been spent in virtual environments. And I would guess that for all of us, this time has served as a reminder of just how valuable it is to be physically present with one another and to be able to see and to feel and experience the world around us firsthand. And this is especially true when thinking about education and why it has been such a priority at Notre Dame to have our students here on campus. And by the way, it's a beautiful sunny day in South Bend on campus, I must mention. So today I'm, I'm just thrilled. I'm excited to introduce to you two Notre Dame leaders who through their work provide students the opportunity to experience firsthand priceless manuscripts, works of art, and other rare collections that can make a student's on-campus experience at Notre Dame really come to life. The first is Diane Parr Walker. Diane was appointed as the Edward H. Arnold University Librarian at Notre Dame in 2011, and in that role oversees more than 3.5 million physical volumes maintained at the Hesburgh Library and the eight branch libraries across campus. Diane has spent her career dedicated to the library sciences and prior to coming to Notre Dame in 2011, spent 27 years in various roles in service of the university libraries at the University of Virginia. During her tenure at Notre Dame, Diane launched a multi-year, multi-phased renovation of the Hesburgh Library, redesigned the library's organizational structure, and has expanded faculty and staff expertise to better integrate the role of the library into the full cycle of teaching and research. Little fun fact about Diane that I recently learned in this is that during this, during this pandemic, she and her husband, Paul, have been hiking the Appalachian Trail. Yep, you heard me. I said hiking the Appalachian Trail. Okay, so they've been doing it virtually through an app on Paul's phone, but nevertheless, pretty impressive and pretty cool. So Diane, welcome. And I hope that at some point this afternoon, you might share a bit more about this virtual adventure with us. Yeah. I'm also thrilled to be joined by Joe Becker, director and curator of sculpture at the Snipe Museum of Art. Joe was appointed to this role in 2018 after serving as the founding director and curator of the Sculpture Park at Frederick Meyer Gardens and Sculpture Park in Grand Rapids, Michigan. At Notre Dame, Joe leads a staff responsible for exhibition development and educational programs that serve Notre Dame students and faculty, as well as thousands of primary and secondary school students who visit the Snipe Museum of Art each year. Joe has played a major role as well in helping to design the university's new Racklin Murphy Museum of Art, which is currently under development. Rumor has it that as a teenager, Joe entered into museum work in a rather clandestine way. Joe, let me welcome you to the show, and I sure hope we get the story behind that rumor this afternoon as well. You got it. Thank you. I've really been looking forward to this chat as, as you both oversee incredibly unique areas here at Notre Dame. So for those viewers who may be unfamiliar with your collections, who, who may not have been back to campus for some time, I'd love to just start, start out today by discussing what it is that we collect, how our students and faculty engage with these collections, and what makes our libraries and our museum unique. So Diane, let's kick it off with you. Would love your perspective on this. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm going to focus on rare books and special collections, as uh, we've said, rather than our general collections. As Sarah said, we've got well over three, almost four million volumes in the library. But the portion that I want to focus on today is housed in our rare books and special collections unit, um, which curates the university's collections of rare and unique uh, research materials. The special collections that we uh, steward are tied very closely to the teaching curriculum and our primary collection areas mirror very much the historical strengths, academic strengths of the university. So to give you just a few examples, um, Notre Dame has one of the strongest um, programs in medieval studies in the country, if not the world. And so it's important to us to have rare and unique primary source materials, that is materials that come from the Middle Ages. 
uh, so that students and faculty can use them in their teaching and in their research. Similarly, uh, we have a, a very close collaboration with the Keonaughton Institute, and we complement their work with a, a prestigious um, collection of Irish studies material that's used not just by the Irish studies program, but also uh, curricula like music, because one of the keystones in that collection is a uh, um, Irish music collection. Um, of course, Notre Dame has a long affiliation with athletics. So our Joyce Sports Research Collection is, um, has grown to be one of the largest accumulations of sports related print and manuscript material in the world. We hold really deep research collections of photographs, magazines, media guides, all kinds of artifacts that document not just football, but also baseball, basketball, boxing, and so forth. And then the, the final one that I'll cite is uh, this area is also home to the university archives. And the archives uh, job is to collect, preserve, and make accessible the university's official records, but also documents that uh, speak to and capture the student experience at Notre Dame. Um, and um, as a part of that collection, we've built a very strong repository for the study of American Catholicism. Um, to your question about uniqueness, what distinguishes the Hesburgh libraries from other research libraries in the future will be these rare and unique collections um, and the way in which we make them broadly available uh, for scholarly access from uh, across the globe by digitizing them. So we refer to these collections as destination collections, meaning that um, scholars from around the US and around the world, we hope, will travel to use our materials, as well as uh, providing really good educational opportunities for students at Notre Dame to conduct specialized original research. Okay, so Diane, you're gonna have to promise me that um, before you retire that I get like a personal tour from you. I wanna learn more on that whole athletics archive piece, the, the, the parts that you have. Yeah. Um, obviously I've been a little familiar with the archives and the Middle medieval studies. I have spent some time up there too. It's really fascinating, um, the depth and breadth of, of the, the collections that we have in that area. So so I'm gonna, I'm gonna if the offer stands, I'm kind of inviting myself, but I'd love to do that before you leave us here in July. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Let's do it. All right. Thank you. All right, Joe, let's turn to you and let's get similar thoughts on the same topics as, as you think about your collections from an art perspective. Um, and what is it that makes the museum here on campus unique? Would love you would love your thoughts there. Sure. Well, thanks for, for having me. And it's always uh, great to be in the same room, so to speak, with uh, Diane. She's been a she's been a great partner and colleague here on campus. Um, you know, the museum is probably one of the great uh, hidden gems, not just uh, here at the University of Notre Dame, but in the United States, which is a little bit surprising considering the depth and the breadth and the quality of the uh, collection. We actually have one of the uh, oldest uh, university collections in the United States. We actually go back to 1875. So our collection, therefore our museum predates Harvard, predates uh, Yale, uh, Stanford. I think it's the fourth or the fifth oldest uh, such collection in the United States. Um, it's also a very large uh, collection. There are about 30,000 objects uh, that are housed here. Um, many of them are on view, but even more so necessarily uh, are in storage, but can be brought out uh, for special occasions for uh, special exhibitions. And I guess the last thing that I would say is uh, the quality is uh, quite extraordinary. Um, we uh, have visitors that uh, come from around the globe to see pieces. We are regularly asked to uh, loan pieces to exhibitions. Uh, as a matter of fact, this coming spring, which is uh, getting closer by the minute, I feel, uh, we have loans that are going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the National Gallery in Washington, and to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, and just last week, we sent a painting off to Paris. Hmm. So it's a really uh, significant uh, collection. 
But I think one of the most uh, engaging things is that it's in this wonderful academic environment and that we are a resource for uh, faculty and students. And then I'll say a few words in a little bit also for the uh, larger community. So um, in our last regular year, so I'll go back uh, a year, we had uh, over 590 classes that came to the museum. And that meant about 12,500 students that came for a tour. They came as a part of a project. They came for a program. And they were actually interacting with authentic works of art. And, you know, in many ways, looking back on my own academic career, I'm very jealous. You know, these students don't know how wonderful it really is. Um, add to that the fact that, you know, it's not just about students coming over from art, art, history, and design. We're very highly used across the humanities, languages, but also in the sciences. Um, there are many faculty that use this uh, as a resource for a class. They ask to have things put on display. They ask for special seminars. So it really is a true uh, resource for Notre Dame, but also by extension uh, to St. Mary's and, and to Holy Cross. Uh, we are also uh, very much an outward facing element of the university. Um, we had, you mentioned uh, the younger students, we have usually between 11 and 12,000 K-12 students that come for a tour. Uh, we're fully embedded in this region uh, uh, of Indiana and in Southern Michigan, so that we're a very important resource for students and teachers and families. And we really do a lot in terms of helping to uh, uh, engage conversations around diversity, around equity, and around inclusion. Um, in terms of strengths, uh, Diane said some very wonderful things about the library and their strengths. Um, we have an extraordinary collection of uh, 19th century art, and particularly French art, therefore that loan that I mentioned to uh, Paris. Um, we have one of the nation's most important collections of Mesoamerican art. Scholars come from all over the United States and Central and South America to study it. We have a very important uh, collection of African art, of native art, um, obviously, because of the history of Notre Dame and, and who and what we are, we have a very important collection of uh, religious paintings that go back to the Middle Ages. So it's not every museum director that has a Renaissance Madonna on their back wall, mm -hmm. but uh, I take advantage of it uh, of when I can. So we're very, very fortunate to be here. And um, as I said, we're kind of a hidden gem, but uh, you mentioned the new Racklin Murphy Museum of Art. We are certainly polishing ourselves up to uh, reintroduce ourselves to the world. Yeah, I, I agree, Joe. I, I, I think you nailed it uh, on the head when you say a hidden gem. I think of my time as a, an undergrad and a grad student, and obviously it was, it was you played a role in all of our educational experiences as students. But I, I, I don't think as a community member, I mean, I can tell you from people around here, I don't think people understand what it is that you bring to this community. And so I love the idea was you, you're going to become more outward facing and sit here on the edge of campus um, and be able to tap into that whole, a whole new audience for yourselves um, and just to see the good work that you guys are doing. It's very so, exciting. Excited to see where that goes. All right, well, let's, let's shift. I'd like to ask you guys a little bit. Um, around where we go kind of with new items. So obviously you talked a little bit about just the impact that we have, right? Both student faculty and community. Let's, let's talk about how are we constantly looking at bringing new, interesting, useful collections um, to campus, be it the library or the museum. So let's, Joe, let me go right back to you on the museum. How do you attract new items to it? Sure. So, you know, we are always uh, building the collections. Um, some things we are continuing to add to our strengths. And in other areas, we're uh, trying to build up areas that we feel are important or we hear from students and faculty are important. So um, you'll hear some parallels probably with Diane, but uh, works tend to come to us in one of three ways. Uh, number one, they are the collectors themselves and collectors come in every shape and size and dimension and part of the country and socioeconomic uh, uh, background because people love these objects for whatever reason. Maybe they collect drawings, maybe they collect prints, maybe they collect uh, ceramics. It's been integral to their life and they wanna make sure that these objects are fully loved for future generations. And so one of the things that's different between an academic art museum and say a civic art museum is how we engage so many people with those collections. Things just don't stay uh, in storage. So the object outright might come to us. 
The second thing that can happen is that someone uh, uh, decides to be generous with funds and they provide those funds as uh, a part of a very, very specific estate gift or uh, maybe it's something that they do during their lifetime that says, you know what, I really love French culture and I would like for you to build your collection of French drawings. So it may be very specific or somebody might say, I love the work that the museum is doing. I'd like to make this gift so that you can continue to do that great work. That's the second category. And the third category is really a two point uh, one, and that's uh, uh, individuals um, that very um, much like the idea of how the arts can affect education in so many different branches. And they're very open with us. It could be for not just building collections, but it could be for research opportunities. It could be for exhibitions, which is very important for us to do. So those are the main ways that uh, things come into um, the museum. Um, as a result, we do have some endowments that allow us to acquire on our own. Um, those are modest, I would say, in comparison to what happens in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the art world. And then I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, it's a whole very uh, uh, judicious process about bringing something in because we take on the responsibility, not just for the object, but for that individual who's given either the work to us or the monies for that work to us. Great. Well, as the development officer, I, you know, I, I like the little plug there that we don't have enough endowment. So I will we'll work on that for you. you. Get you some more new money so that it can be a, a, a bigger way for you to bring new items to the to the museum. All right, Diane, how about you? How does that compare and contrast to how it works for, for the, you in the library? Yeah, thanks, Sarah and Joe. It, uh, in the libraries, it's very uh, similar. Um, we are blessed to have some excellent endowments um, for collection building in the libraries. And so I would say more of our materials are likely to come by our purchases, which we would make from dealer catalogs, auctions, um, sometimes from private individuals or organizations. But these purchases are possible because of the library endowments that have been designated by donors for the support of building collections. And as Joe said, sometimes the collection, the focus of an endowment is very specific um, to add things to our Dante collection, for example, in other times um, more general. But um, that allows us the flexibility to look for things that specifically support the teaching or new areas of research in the uh, in the academy. Um, we're also uh, grateful for gifts of significant value that um, we can add to the collection. In many cases, um, the archives benefit from gifts from alumni, from people who are connected and have artifacts that are important to documenting the history of Notre Dame. Um, and we also occasionally will be uh, approached by a, a collection owner because they think that Notre Dame might be the appropriate home for their treasures. Um, for example, in 2014, the Sisters of Loretto offered us the opportunity to purchase the Baden, what we call the Baden Bible. It's a, an artifact that's central to American Catholic history. And it had been in the keeping of the sisters for many, many, many years. But they contacted us feeling that it was uh, perhaps because of Notre Dame's active scholarship in the, in the area of American Catholicism and because of Notre Dame's historical connection with Father Stephen Baden. Uh, they thought it might be more appropriately housed here. And so we were able to, to uh, uh, acquire that item that way. Another um, wonderful recent example is the Farrell, uh, the manuscripts from the Farrell family that uh, the audience will hear a little bit more about shortly. Um, that was a gift from a private collector. The Farrell family had no prior relationship with Notre Dame, but they wanted to give some of their collection materials to an institution that would use them actively in engaging with students. And so they consulted a medieval manuscript dealer for advice and because she knows that that's one of the emphasis uh, in our collecting, 
she put them in touch with us. And so we benefited from that, um, from that wonderful connection just by the community knowing about our interests and about how we use our materials for teaching. Good, and I certainly hope today and more programs like this will continue to spread that word about the opportunity um, for people to, to continue to bless you with the collections that they have. So thank you. Um, obviously a lot in your collection, Diane, yours, Joe, just incredible work to date. And um, I know earlier this week, you both took time to give us kind of an inside look at a particularly donated item, um, that one that was featured in this night and one at the Hesburgh Library. So we're going to let the audience take a look right now at those two segments. In October 2017, James and Elizabeth Farrell donated six remarkable medieval manuscripts from their private collection to the Hesburgh Library's Rare Books and Special Collections Department. This collection now provides some of the library's most valuable examples of illuminated manuscripts from the late Middle Ages. The Farrell manuscripts showcase highly developed styles of painting that were used in different manuscript genres from three very important regions of book production in the medieval world, France, Italy, and the Netherlands. I'd like to highlight three of the pieces from the collection in particular. The Feral Bible, which we label Feral Manuscript Number 1, is a fantastic example of the type of historiated Bibles produced during the 13th century in Paris. Artisans there were renowned for their brilliant talent, innovative techniques, and intricate detailing. The Feral Bible was illuminated by the artisans of the Ville de Saint-Denis in Paris in about 1240. They had an illustrious clientele, including the local cathedral and several monasteries. Although this was one of the most active paint shops of the period, today only about 40 manuscripts that were made there are known to survive. The Feral Hours, Feral Manuscript Number 2 is a book of prayers for daily use. These personal prayer books, known as books of hours, were medieval bestsellers and were often richly decorated with beautiful borders and full page paintings. The Feral Hours was produced in French Flanders in the 1470s. All of the paintings in the Feral Hours were done using the grisé technique. Quite rare and luxurious, the grisé technique uses only hues of gray. At first glance, the paintings may look unfinished, but upon closer look, they reveal extremely innovative artistry and discipline. The third object is a Visconti Sforza tarot card, which we label manuscript Feral number five. Renaissance tarot was a card game played by the Italian elite. It had not yet acquired popularity as a method for fortune telling. This particular tarot card was made in northern Italy for the Visconti Sforza family, who ruled the Duchy of Milan until 1535. Renaissance tarot cards are extremely rare, and very few decks survive. This card is one of three known cards with this image and the last surviving card from its tarot deck. The value of the feral gift cannot be underestimated, especially in today's world. These items are well beyond the reach of our normal acquisitions budget, and the feral families Generosity enabled these materials to find a home at Notre Dame and within the larger scholarly community. But even more than their monetary value, the impact of the Farrell manuscripts on teaching, learning, and research at Notre Dame is profound. Today's students are immersed in a digital world, hands-on experience with these invaluable historic objects 
can be transformative, potentially inspiring and reshaping student outlooks and individual career paths. We use the Feral Manuscripts for teaching in a variety of contexts at Notre Dame. These range from large undergraduate class visits to rare books and special collections, to their inclusion in specific graduate courses on advanced topics like medieval book production and Latin handwriting. In addition to teaching world-class manuscripts like the Farrell Collection have significant research value. As an example, when we acquired the tarot card, little was known about it. Through collaborative research, library curators David Gura and Tracy Bergstrom have linked the motif to a larger group of cards at Yale University, as well as to a private collection. They've developed a new methodology to study Renaissance tarot cards as objects, not just painted images. As with teaching, the possibilities for research and inquiry are also endless. And not only for our librarians and faculty, undergraduate and graduate students are encouraged to use the manuscripts in their theses, course presentations, and research papers. Our commitment to accessibility, both public and research-based, makes the impact of a gift such as this all the greater. As important as the hands-on experience of these special manuscripts is, the Hesburgh Libraries are also committed to offering digital access and images of unique and rare materials whenever possible. This particular collection is fully digitized and available to researchers and scholars around the world online. One final but very important note. The feral gift also enters the library with clear records of ownership, legal purchase, and uncontestable provenance for all materials. This is the type of gift that can be exhibited with transparency, used without restriction, and for which we have no concerns about possible future repatriation. We're honored to preserve and make accessible the Feral Collection and other unique artifacts. Doing so exemplifies our library mission of connecting people to knowledge across geographic locations and throughout time. Hello, welcome to the Snipe Museum of Art here at the University of Notre Dame. My name is Joe Becker and I'm honored to serve as the director. We're standing here in the galleries of modern and contemporary art and I wanted to share with you two things about this wonderful painting. It's by the Spanish artist whose name is Juan Miro, probably one of the most prolific and certainly one of the most creative figures in the whole history of 20th century art. A compatriot of Picasso's, he is equally well known as a painter, a sculptor, a printmaker, and draftsperson. And we are so fortunate here at the University of Notre Dame to have this painting, which is called Signs and Configurations, and it's been here since the 1990s. This piece is very lyrical, very whimsical. You might even say there's a childlike quality to the work. Well, Miro was associated with two of the most important movements of the early 20th century, Dadaism and, perhaps more significant for our conversation today, Surrealism. Surrealism which drew on the power of the subconscious, which really celebrated creativity. So in the early 20th century, you have a series of artists who were letting their imaginations go. There was a certain freedom, there was a certain liberty. As a matter of fact, he talks about the freedom and liberation of just drawing in this painting. Tell you a little bit about this work. For Miro, it's pretty typical in terms of the characters that are seen, the lyrical lines, the faces go which in different directions. You can really almost see an energy of creative expression bubbling up to the surface. 
However, it's an unusual painting in another way because, as some of you probably know, Miro's works have a tendency to be very bright and very colorful, but this is monochromatic. The black paint is across the surface of a kind of sandpaper. As a matter of fact, it's the kind of sandpaper that they would have used in Spain underneath roofing tiles. One of the reasons that he chose during this very specific period, about 1936, to work without color was the seriousness of the politics that he saw around him in Spain, and what was happening across Europe, and into Germany. He wanted there to be a severity, at least in part, to his art during this particular moment. But this work might remind us of hieroglyphics, might remind us of graffiti, might even remind us of the art of children, something that was just beginning to be celebrated in the early 20th century. Miro's impact was great. He was collected by most of the important museums, not only in Europe, but across the United States, and many of the most important private collectors as well. We're thrilled to have this great painting in our collection. It celebrates Miro. It helps us to understand surrealism, creativity, but if we dig a little bit deeper, it's an opportunity to think about history and politics and art making. One of the great things about being at a university museum is that there are so many different types of users, so many different types of individuals that come into our spaces. Sure, there's lots of folks that come from art, art history, design, but you can imagine people that are coming here from psychology, sociology, anthropology, history, political science, that could use a painting like this as a part of their curriculum or just as a part of their personal enjoyment. Like you, oftentimes when I go to a museum, I'm drawn to that placard, which is just to the right of the museum. A lot of great information there, as you know. The title, we already know, it's Joan Miro, Signs and Configurations from 1936, and all that information about the fact that it's oil and tar paper and board, but there's another very important part of this text. Bequest of Miss May E. Walter. Miss Walter was an extremely important donor to the University of Notre Dame. Although she was not an alum and she had no direct connection to the university, except through Father Lauk, who was the director two directors ago here at the museum. Father Lauk, on many of his trips to New York, spent time with Miss Walter and convinced her that the University of Notre Dame would be an important and appropriate place for her renowned collection of modern and contemporary art. She became one of the first members of our advisory council. She traveled to South Bend many times, and over the course of nearly 30 years of her engagement with the university and with this museum, she became, in many ways, the ideal donor. Over 81 works, 81 works were given to the university, given to this museum by Miss Walter. First, there were the things that she gave during her lifetime. Second, there were those things that were bequested to us after her death. And third, there was an endowment that she set up that allowed us to continue to purchase works of art and keep her interests alive. For all intents and purposes, when you go to any museum or any gallery and you see this placard and you understand who the artist is and what the title is and where the artist is from, and what the materials are, that's fantastic. But when you look at that second piece of information and you find out who the donor is, you're participating in a legacy. You're participating in something that allows the person that was gracious enough to give us that gift or give us the funds to allow that gift to unfold to continue a vibrant history. We are forever grateful to someone like Miss Walter. As a matter of fact, here we are in 2021 and we're still talking about her. If you're interested in something that might be in your collection or something in a collection that you know of, if you're interested in future engagement with the university through the visual arts, if you're directly interested in something for the museum, let us know. Contact your development officer or just feel free to contact me here at the museum. Thank you very much and thank you for your support of the University of Notre Dame.
Diane, Joe, thank you again. Uh, those are those are incredible pieces. I um, I love the behind the scenes look. Thank you for Joe, Diane, both of you kind of giving us the story behind them. That you know, Joe, your comments around legacy just really poignant, very meaningful, uh, and certainly moving. Um, so thank you for that. It um, I, I got to say, I'm also really struck um, when I hear you both share those stories. Just again, how accessible these collections are. Uh, obviously, you both point out both to the students and the faculty, but really, again, to that community. And, and I want to make sure that our audience understands that, just how accessible they are, um, certainly certainly in more normal non-COVID times, right? Of course. But thank you again. Great, great stories. I, I am, I'm now pleased um, to welcome to the conversation today my colleague from our gift planning team, TJ Polari to explain how the process works when benefactors are considering gifts of art or rare books. And I, I'm gonna ask though, before we dive into some of these more practical questions with TJ, Joe and Diane, I just have a couple more quick questions for you. And the first is, I, I'd really love to hear more about your vision that each of you have um, for building your collections. So kind of thinking ahead, what are the goals and the priorities for your years ahead? Diane, do you wanna, do you wanna take this first? Sure, happy to. Um, as Joe and I have both uh, said, our collection, our focus is that the collection should be a teaching collection. So it should be um, materials. We will continue that focus. Anything we bring in needs to be uh, available for student uh, study and for faculty and graduate student um, research. From the university archives uh, perspective, we're always interested in documentation of the especially the diversity of student experiences that we may not already have captured in the archives collection. So artifacts like programs or posters from Notre Dame events. Um, for rare books and special collections, we will continue to, to focus our uh, building uh, of collections on the historical strengths of the university, but we also regularly seek to expand into new areas of collecting in response to evolving teaching and research needs, academic priorities, uh, new disciplines and modes of intellectual inquiry, but also sometimes just in response to gift opportunities. Um, for example, in the past, We've collaborated with faculty and donors to identify and take advantage of opportunities to build prestigious collections in new areas of interest. Um, we have a now a premier Russian and East European studies collection that really started because of a partnership with a member of the, of the university faculty here. And our Latin and American, Latin American rather, and Iberian studies collections uh, grew initially based on the interests and financial support of several uh, highly engaged donors. And those are active research collections now. Um, our current focus uh, is also on now diversifying our collections. We're actively looking to identify areas of existing strength and making sure that we know where we need to broaden the perspectives on the histories that are represented in our collections. So right now, our American History Curator is actively seeking to add uh, voices of enslaved people and women to our American manuscripts holdings, especially um, strengthening our already strong holdings in the period of the American Civil War through those perspectives. And we recently were able to acquire a large uh, Cuban slavery archive that includes manuscript documentation related to slavery and enslaved people in Cuba in the 19th, second half of the 19th century. So those are areas that we'll continue to want to focus on and would love to hear from anyone who has uh, materials that they think might help us to broaden that perspective. Excellent, thank you, Diane. Joe, let's flip it right over to you. What are your thoughts? Give us a give us some sense of your vision in collecting. Well, you know, it's really multi-part. Um, you know, there's a, a an honest part that says we we play to our strengths. 
you know, we continue to invest in some of the great collections that we have, find pieces of the puzzle that may be missing. So, you know, we certainly have one of the best collections of photography in the United States. We've got about 11,000 photographs in that collection. And when uh, important things that aren't covered uh, come available, if we can do it, uh, we do it. Um, we have also heard, and I mentioned this earlier on from the students, from the faculty, from the staff, there is such a hunger to engage with more contemporary art. And so the opportunity to look at, to bring onto campus uh, more examples of contemporary art is a high, high priority. You know, in many ways, uh, the visual arts have become the lingua franca of uh, these uh, last two generations. And um, it's a very global experience. So more and more examples of contemporary art are important for us. I would also uh, kind of uh, celebrate what Diane said uh, about uh, diversity. You know, we've been very fortunate to have that in our DNA going back for, for decades, but we've made some really significant uh, acquisitions. Uh, just a few uh, months ago, we were able to uh, acquire some very important examples of African-American photography, including three photographs from the first African-American owned photography studio in the United States. Um, we um, have brought on several very prominent examples of contemporary African-American artists. Right now, we have a work with Kevin Beasley from the Joyner Jafrida collection. Fred Jafrida is a Notre Dame alum. It's one of the best collections of its kind uh, uh, in the world. But I think that uh, moving forward, one of the things, because we take collecting so seriously, it's an obligation. You're bringing somebody into your house. You're bringing somebody into your, into your home. Um, you know, for me, a quality is very important. You know, in a university setting, you know, we want to have the best microscopes for our students. We want to have the best air machines for our athletes. You know, I think that um, in terms of the objects we bring in, we want to make sure that they're the highest quality uh, possible. So sometimes uh, that means that we have to say no or it means that we have to admit some things are a little bit out of our reach. But when those important gems do come available and they bring them in, we give them the opportunity to shine. Great, so Joe, let me follow up on that because you mentioned you know, going into people's homes and that. You know, I can only imagine that generous benefactors who are donating items um, to us, you know, in some cases, they, they've spent a lifetime collecting these and it can't be easy to part with them, be it, be it art or Diane's case, the rare books, or just other items that have become part of someone's home and their life. So with that in mind, like, tell the audience, what makes Notre Dame unique as a home for these pieces and why benefactors should feel really, really good about the university's stewardship of their pieces? Well, you know, I'm still relatively new to Notre Dame, but one of the things that attracted me to uh, take on this, this leadership role was the level of quality, speaking of quality, that I see throughout the university. The attention to detail, um, the care for facilities, um, the uh, care for the students, the care for the faculty, research opportunities, and so on and so forth. So I think that one thing that I can say in general is that if someone's considering a donation, and they're probably very attached to those objects, as you said, you have to put it in the larger context of a caring community where quality matters, where interpretation matters, where staying relevant is extremely uh, important. So there are certain things that are baked into the mix. Um, it's not necessarily the same kind of opportunity that you would have for an object that goes into a large civic museum or metropolitan museum, wherein things could be put into storage and never seen again. There are things that are, yes, out on permanent display here, but there's also things that regularly come out for a seminar, they come out for the course of the semester, they come out for a scholar to examine. So there's a kind of new life, there's a kind of new set of opportunities uh, for those objects. You know, I feel, I've always felt as a curator and somebody that's an objects person, you really have to honor the relationship that you're inheriting. You know, most people that collect, collect something that means something to them. They love French literature. They love uh, Spanish art. They love Roman culture. Um, there's a pretty good chance that they didn't study it formally, but somewhere along their lives, their experiences, they, they, they had a seed planted and this is what has flowered. And so when you're talking about something that has been a part of people's lives, you have to honor that tradition. But you also have those conversations, and there are a lot of these conversations, when what somebody loves may not exactly mesh 
with what you need and what you can take care of. And so you have to be honest and respectful to what may or may not work. Just because, you know, this certain object, this figurine has been in my family for five generations, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that it has the same kind of um, opportunity to live in a museum uh, environment. Maybe, maybe important to you personally, but are historically or culturally, it might be a different set of circumstances. And I would never, ever, ever want to mislead someone and say, yes, we'll take this, but, you know, it's never going to be seen again. You know, for me, one of the most jarring images in the Raiders of the Lost Ark is when the Ark gets put up on that shelf and put away and it's never to be seen from again. We want to make sure that the Ark is seen. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Joe. Diane, do you have any thoughts you don't want to add on to that or any, any other comments to add to, to Joe's perspective? around yeah. why Notre Dame, you know, benefactors should feel so good about gifting to Notre Dame some of their valuable collections. Yeah, I would echo much of what Joe said. You know, people who collect uh, rare books, manuscripts, artifacts, often love to share them with people. They share them with people who, who are in, you know, come to visit in their home. And one of the things that we do, because as I said earlier, we consider our rare books, special collections and archives materials to be teaching collections. And so we don't, as, as Joe was saying, we don't just shelve them in the Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, mm -hmm. storage facility. Um, our rare and unique materials are made a part of our teaching collection. We actively work to connect with faculty who can then introduce things to their students. I think one of the things that's um, unusual about Notre Dame, uh, res our research libraries here and our uh, rare and specialized collections is that in many institutions, those materials in a research library are only available to graduate students and faculty. Undergraduate students don't often get a chance to interact with these historic artifacts in the way that we try to make sure they can here. So the opportunity for a class of undergraduate students in a wide variety of classes to come and appreciate the historical importance of something that has been an important part of a collector's collection is a, a special sort of stewardship that we can offer for those materials here at Notre Dame. And as Joe said, we take very, very seriously our responsibility as stewards for anything that we take in. And I would echo what he said, we also try to be responsible about that. If it really, if it's not something that we can use well for teaching or take good care of, we're we're not going to mislead someone into giving us something that that really doesn't fit our capacity for maintaining it. Good, thank you both for that uh, for those insights. Appreciate it. Now let me shift. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring TJ back in, and TJ um, is part of our gift planning office. And I, I want to ask TJ, like for those in the audience who maybe now or in the future are considering a gifting kind of either art, rare books to the university. Um, TJ, walk us through what the process looks like and where should these folks begin as, they, as they're as they you know having these thoughts of, of making such a donation? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. It's great to be part of the conversation. Thank you, Joe and Diane, for featuring those, those beautiful and unique pieces. Uh, so this begins with a conversation. Um, Joe and Diane put it better than I could. Um, we have to be very selective about what we're taking on for the reasons that they mentioned, the priorities that we have as a university and and wanting to make sure we're good stewards of those pieces. So the best place to begin very simply, Sarah, is a conversation with your development representative if you work with a member of our team. If you do not, um, you can uh, really contact any of us in our gift planning group. And you can find us, Sarah, at plangiving.nd.edu. Um, and really, we, just, we, we begin with a conversation about the details of the pieces. We gather as much as we can, and then we, we go back to Joe and Diane and their teams and talk about whether this fits with, with the priorities that they have. Um, and then we take it from there. Okay, so let me ask you a real practical question because you know typically donors um, are able to benefit from a tax deduction when they make a gift to Notre Dame. Is that 
the case also when it comes to gifts of art or rare books? Yeah, so this it's a really good question. And the first thing I would say here is that um, every situation is unique, especially when we're talking about these types of, of gifts. So it's really important that any benefactor considering a gift like this works closely with tax and legal counsel of their own to, to walk through the scenarios. Um, but yes, generally these gifts are tax deductible, typically at their fair market value, so long as a benefactor has held the piece for more than a year, and so long as the benefactor is deemed a collector and not a dealer by the IRS. Um, but the really the key difference in a gift of something like this compared to something like a gift of cash or a gift of, of securities is the substantiation requirements. Um, and so there's a couple of things that are really important. One is that in order to value the piece, there is a requirement of something called a qualified appraisal. And um, that's, a, that's a term of art. So the specifics of that are, are based upon IRS guidance. And there's an, there's an IRS publication called Publication 561 that um, details what that means. But essentially this appraisal needs to be obtained uh, no sooner than 60 days before the gift is made and no later than the date that the taxpayer's uh, income tax return is due in which they're claiming the deduction. And then along with that, Sarah, they, there's a requirement to file a unique IRS form called Form 8283. And that form um, is signed by the appraiser. It's signed by Notre Dame also as the recipient of the gift. And sometimes depending upon the value of the gift, that form needs to be attached to uh, the, uh, the appraisal needs to be attached to that form as well when it's filed. All of this is again detailed in IRS guidance, but our role as, as gift planners in our office is to walk with you through that process. And so um, we, uh, we very happily um, talk with donors and work with their advisors about all the steps that need to happen in these cases. Okay, so let's let's assume best case scenario, TJ, um, all parties, right? They're ready to move forward with making a gift. Of, of, of uh, art, of, of um, rare books, be it what it may. What, what, what happens next? Where do they go? How, does, how do we bring it all together here? Yeah, so there, there's, there's two different contexts in which this happens. Um, the, the, the Walter gifts are, are a great example of this where some of those gifts were made during her lifetime and some were made through her estate. And so the, the steps that we take are of course different in each scenario. If we're talking about a gift through an estate, then uh, our team will work with you and your counsel on specific language to include in your estate planning documents. Typically, we'll also include some separate documentation we would keep on file to just make sure all of this fits hand in glove. Um, and then if it's an outright gift, typically we would work with the, the benefactor and, and his or her advisors on a very simple deed of gift to document the transfer, memorialize the rights and responsibilities of that, that transfer process and um, just make sure everything is, is very clean in terms of, of the transfer. But um, again, the most important thing, Sarah, I would say is, is um, we are here to help in that process. We welcome inquiries about any type of gift like this, and, and we, uh, we uh, consider it um, a great privilege to walk with you every step of the way and, and your advisors as well. Awesome. Thanks, TJ. And, and I would say for the viewers, just TJ does a fantastic job, as does our entire gift planning staff. Um, you know, when he starts quoting tax code and numbers, that's exactly why we have folks like him that can that can uh, carry the load for us in that regard. So we're, we're grateful for your expertise and uh, your continued insights and good work on our behalf. So thank you. All right, so Joe and Diane, as we kind of put a wrap on this today, um, final thoughts for the audience? And listen, I, I haven't heard about the Appalachian Trail. Joe, I haven't heard about this clandestine en entree into museum work. So I hope as we kind of wrap and you give your final thoughts, we can hear a little bit about both of those fun facts. You go first, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah, regarding the Appalachian Trail, as, as Sarah said, my husband and I lived in uh, in Virginia, specifically Charlottesville, Virginia, for uh, almost three decades. And where we were in Charlottesville, we were about 30 miles from the Skyline Drive and where the Appalachian Trail goes through uh, Virginia on its way from Georgia to Maine. And so we, we would hike stretches of it in small segments as day hikes and really enjoyed that. So as, as COVID has had us uh, continually more isolated or just continually isolated um, and unable to travel, we uh, latched onto an app uh, that is downloaded to my husband's phone that 
allows you to map your steps as it records them to, along the trail. Uh, so far, we've gotten from Georgia to the just about the Tennessee border. We're about to get into the <laughs> into the Smoky Mountains, so so we've got a long way to go. Uh, but it, we also have a ways to go on uh, in our COVID journey as well. I think so. It's been a fun fun way to to do that. Um, and as far as final thoughts for our conversation here, I I would like to close just by expressing my gratitude for the many ways in which the Notre Dame family supports the Hesburgh Libraries and our mission of connecting people to knowledge. Um, and over the years, our partnership with alumni and friends of the university have really enhanced our holdings and built our reputation as a destination for research and scholarship. I'm really glad to have had the chance today to share uh, the story and to plant, I hope, some seeds for future collaborations. All right, Joe, bring us home. All right. Well, I, I, I think that, um, you know, one of the great things about being on a university or a college campus is that, you know, you are constantly renewed and you're constantly thinking about uh, your own youth and, you know, the things that were great about it and the things that you wish you would have had. And, you know, thinking back, you know, Diane talking about 13th century manuscripts or my talking about 20th century surrealism, you know, the fact that on this campus, we offer those kind of rich experiences is just, just extraordinary. And as I said earlier on, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous, but I'm also excited for the people that have this opportunity. You know, one of the things that happened last semester that really took me off guard and it's starting to happen already this semester, our students and faculty, because we're only open to the Notre Dame campus right now, that stop me in the galleries downstairs and say, thank you. Thank you for opening up the museum. We have been starved to be around works of art. You know, you can do lots of stuff online. You can have those virtual experiences, but when you're actually with the object, whether it's a manuscript or it's a piece of ceramics or a photograph, there's something that's magical about the scale, about the texture, about the surfaces, about the physicality of it all. So, you know, that sticks with me. Now, in terms of being young, uh, my clandestine entry into museum work um, I will say that I would be uh, described as an adventurous uh, youth. And um, I had a hard time staying on grounds at my high school. So I played hooky a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I like to think it's because I was bored. And, um, you know, I'd have to kind of scurry behind the convent and down through the woods, but then I made a clean break. And uh, I would always go downtown to museums. And when I finally got nabbed, um, and they brought me into the assistant principal's office, you know, not the place that any teenager wants to be found. Um, and they brought me before the uh, sisters that ran the school. Um, they asked me what I was doing and, you know, how could I do this and jeopardizing this and that and the other. And they said, well, what were you doing? And I said, well, I've been going to museums. And they were so astonished and they ran some fact checks against me and they found out that I was in fact going to the museums. Uh, they let me off the hook. So uh, from that early moment uh, and from some later adventure, adventure similar, um, I began to realize that uh, museums and, and art were uh, a resource, but they were also a refuge. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you both for joining us today. This, is, this has been fascinating. Really appreciated that little personal glimpse there at the end into both of your lives. Um, just the work that you're doing is amazing. The impact, the incredible impact that you personally and both just the library and the museum have on our students and our community really needs to be celebrated. I, I, I mean this when I say it, Notre Dame is truly blessed by both of your leadership. So thank you. And to everyone watching today, thank you for joining us. We're thrilled that you were able to, and I hope that someday soon we can welcome you back to campus. And I will say sunny South Bend, which is almost as rare as some of these collections that we're talking about today. <laughs> so thank you everyone for being with us. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.